Proverbs chapter 22. Old Testament passage of scripture. Many of us know it by heart. Proverbs 22. And you'll find this verse, this reading in verse 6. Proverbs 22. And the sixth verse. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up, apprentice a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, when he grows up, he will not depart from it. He may be seated. I need to speak with you topically as well as pastorally today on this passage of scripture and training up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it just for the next few moments I want to talk to you from this thought seven traits of successful parenting seven traits of successful parenting as we continue from last week in our family series called A Home Covered by the Word of God. I think for those of us who are parents that we all have ideas about what we think will work as far as it comes to being successful parents and as far as parenting is concerned. We think about how we will handle discipline and how we can help our kids maintain their sexual purity, help them reach their goals, and help them learn how to enter the world so that they can be responsible Christian young adults. Unfortunately, there's no classes. We don't learn about it in school. And we find ourselves often at a loss at how to be an effective parent. When our children are very young, there are challenges we face that seem so difficult at the time. We then find out that those concerns were relatively small in light of what we see in the latter years of our young people. We try to teach them to love God and to love their family and to love others. But if we're honest today, every parent here would have to admit that they haven't been completely successful. In some ways, we missed the mark. There are three men in the Bible who all had a tremendous amount of wisdom, had these words to share with us. First of all, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and ammunition of the Lord. Solomon in Proverbs 1 and 8, my son, hear the instruction of your father. And do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be graceful ornaments on your head and chains about your neck. And then finally, Jesus in John 15, 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. I remember reading about a multi-million dollar unmanned space probe that was launched from Cape Canaveral to do research on the surface of the planet of Mars. All right. They had all the latest scientific gadgets and all the right equipment to gather more information about the planet. Unfortunately, just as the space probe started its descent to the surface of Mars, it abruptly stopped sending sending information back to Earth. It was though the spacecraft was suddenly gone. Come to find out, it had crashed into the side of one of the mountains on Mars. After the investigation was done, scientists discovered that the crash was caused by communication problems between the probe and NASA. We are told that Houston was speaking to the spacecraft in terms of meters, 
But the spacecraft was programmed in terms of yards and feet. In other words, someone forgot to tell the programmer to use the metric system, and it was the result of a million dollar loss in years of research wasted. I remind you of that story today because I believe that young people today are headed for a similar fate and for some of the same basic reasons. I agree with Dr. Tim Smith who says that many of our young people today are on a collision course with some mountain as well as some problem. They cannot seem to move beyond, amen, or get to the other side. And on the other side, we have parents. Yeah. that appear to be unable to communicate with them in terms that they're able to understand. So what is it today that our young people need more than anything? I agree that there are seven things that every parent should know about parenting and young people, amen, desperately are crying out for. And they are, first of all, successful parenting is understanding there is a need for trust. There is a need for trust. Actually, there is an intrinsic need for trust in all of us, parents as well as children. Yeah. But for many young people today who find themselves in families that are dysfunctional, this need for trust is especially present. We know that there are at least three characteristics of a family that is quote unquote dysfunctional. Now, there are no perfect families in this house. Come on, God. Come on. Come on. But there are basically three characteristics of dysfunction. And the first one is they don't talk. Oh, yes, they speak to each other, but they don't really talk to each other. The old folks used to say it takes time to talk. Good morning. Hmm? That's not talking. How was school today? Okay. That's not talking. Then the second thing there is they don't trust. They have general expectations of each other, but they really don't trust. It, the, the family life is built more on skepticism than trust. Then they don't feel. Don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. They may be pleasantly polite, but there is no real emotional investment into each other. Now, here's what that means. In a family that is dysfunctional, there's some overwhelming problem that is present. It could include any of the following, alcohol, drug abuse, physical or sexual abuse, or if the parent's too rigid, or all rules, no love, and very distant, things like that. Because of one or more of these things being present, the child is forced to keep a secret. They are told, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it with anyone. This is family Business. Oh, we got a couple of amens in the house on that. Yeah, this family bit. We won't, won't discuss this with anybody. Parents won't even allow them to talk to a counselor. Many times it's because of pride gets in the way. We don't want anybody to know that my family may have some dysfunction in it. We ought to just get real with one another that all of our families have some form of dysfunction. When you're thinking and going around like there's no dysfunction, that by its very self says that there's dysfunction because you're hiding something. You, you got a secret somewhere. And you ought to talk about it. Pride gets in the way, and what will people think? And the end result is that young people grow up believing they, in fact, have done something wrong and they can't trust anyone. Rather? Young people in these homes often become very lonely and, amen, very lonely and have a strong sense of failure about them. They don't know why they keep picking the wrong kind of people to be their friends. They don't know why they keep, amen, acting out with certain type of behavior. i tell you why. It's because there's some secret that needs to be resolved in the home. One of the first indications of this occurrence is in the home is a lack of constructive behavior. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and 
the, there was no doubt there was some trouble. They were very troubled over the news, what they were hearing Jesus was saying. And what did this mean that Jesus was about to go? He was the only person that came alongside of them that gave them help and a real sense of security. And now he's talking about leaving. And Jesus is saying to them, listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believed or you trusted in God. Trust also in me. What, what, what is he saying? In the midst of a world where many of our young people are troubled and don't know who to trust, they must understand that Jesus is the person that can always be trusted. Amen. Our children need to be taught that they need to know that Jesus can always be trusted. Always. Mama and daddy, uncle, dad, grandpa, grandma may not allow you to talk to anybody else, but you can get on your knees and talk to Jesus about what's going on in our dysfunctional home. Yeah. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen. You ought to give the Lord a hand. I praise right about that. That's good news. I said that's good news. That the Lord is your helper. So trust is the first thing that we need because Jesus is the one that died for your sins. Thank Secondly, you. successful parenting is understanding there is a need for love. There's a genuine need for unconditional love. In survey after survey, they have been, it has been discovered down through the years that one thing that we've learned about young people today is that even though parents may say, I love you, give lots of hugs and lots of kisses, many young people still don't feel love. I'm hugging you. I'm kissing you. I'm telling you I love you. But a lot of kids don't feel loved. Young people crave for someone who will listen to them, who will try to understand their feelings. Preferably this would be someone of their parents or someone like that. But if we as parents fail to listen to them, if we as felt they make them to make them feel love, they will seek somebody else or something else to make them feel love. Amen. You may not have time right now, but I want you to know Johnny who's sagging and flashing and got all this stuff hanging on. He got time to sit down and hear everything your sweet little daughter has to say. According to one source, about 13,000, about 13 years ago, the American Medical Association published a study about 12,000 young people. The study revealed that the fact that young people don't, the people that, the young people that don't smoke, that don't drink, that don't engage in premarital sex, don't take drugs, or commit acts of violence, all 12,000 of these young people said the number one reason they didn't do these things is because they know without a shadow of a doubt that they are loved by their parents. <laughs> Young people who grew up to be healthy, well-rounded, well-adjusted adults can almost, without looking back, with, with looking back, they can find one parent, at least one parent, who loved them unconditionally, a mom, a dad, someone that loved them without wanting to harm them, someone that loved them and they didn't have to earn their love because it was an unconditional love. It's not love because I do everything that I'm supposed to do. It's unconditional love. Yes, parenting is about having rules and having restrictions. Yes, we'll get to that in a moment. But there needs to be without without any doubt whatsoever that, what, that there is love for you, for who you are, not because of what you do. Our young people are crying out for that kind of love. Amen. But pastor, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love. I have become like sounding brass and twinkling cymbals. How many of us are just that way to our children? We, we get all the right words and all the right phrases, but our actions don't support it. God did say, for God so loved the world, but it led him to some action. That's right. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me 
nothing. Peter said this, that when we look at other people that need love, 1 Peter 4 and 8 says, above all these things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins, a multitude of faults. When I've done wrong, I know I've done wrong. But it's only love that can cover that. If we don't have that type of unconditional love in our heart, we'll live in a home full of resentment one towards the other. The third thing is I hurry on. Successful parenting is understanding that there is a need for safety and security. One of the most common misconceptions about young people today is that we think they do not want guidelines or boundaries. We think that because of what they say to us, they, they use phrases like, I can't wait till I grow up. I, I can't wait till I get out of this house. You're just too strict. Why? Why? Why not? Everybody else is doing it. Come on, Pastor. Y'all never heard that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm gonna give you a minute to just let that soak in just a minute. Come on, Pastor. Don't be fooled. Young people want and need boundaries. You didn't hear Pastor Good. Don't be fooled. Young people want and need boundaries. Why? Because it makes them feel safe and secure and protected. Amen. Some of them just need an excuse that I hey I hey, hey guys I'll roll with you tonight, but you but you know my whole square dad won't let me go out with y'all tonight. Hey, hey, they just need you as an excuse, but but that makes them feel secure and protected because they really don't want to go. But amen. But, 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 but they need somebody that will love them enough that when they get back in your face and call you an old fogey, amen. You don't have to sock them in the mouth. You can just put a big hug on them and kiss them right there on the forehead. They need to feel safe and they need to feel secure. And unless you've got some boundaries and some guidelines for them to follow, they won't know that. One of the most difficult things we do as parents is setting guidelines and boundaries. We want to be liked. We want to be approved. We want to be told we're the best parents ever. Yeah, yeah. If you just say it one time, baby, I'll believe it forever. Come on, preacher. But our security and our protection comes from God. Amen. Hebrews 13, 8, 9 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away about with various and strange doctrines. For it is, for it is good that the heart be established. In grace. Come on, Come on, Doc. What, 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 what are doctrines, if not boundaries, boundaries. guidelines, yes, sir. and limits? Yes. It gives me protection and security in my faith. Yes, sir. I don't step over that boundary because when I go out there, I'm not protected. Yes. But as long as I stay on this side, I'm protected. I feel secure in my faith. Yes, John 10, 29 says, my father who has given to them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand no I and my father are one yes. what great security that I have that I'm in my father's hands and then fourthly successful parenting is understanding there is a need for purpose a need for purpose there is in all of us this need for purpose that is why Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, has been amen, translated into 56 different languages and sold yeah. over 25 million copies. Yeah. So how do we give them purpose? All of us are seeking purpose in life. Why am I doing what am I doing? I'm alive. I wake up. But what am I supposed to do? Am I just supposed to go to school because it's time to go to school? Is it just time to clean my room so I just clean my room? What's the purpose behind all of this? And we've discovered that there are at least three Ds, if you will, for discovery, purpose in one's life. The first one we would call is design. Our children must realize that God has made them according to his master plan. The psalmist says, I, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I need to slow down here just a little bit of a moment here because we, 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 we are designed yes, sir. by God. Yes, yes. Come on. We are designed by God, right. not just emotionally, not just uh, spiritually, 
but physically, we're also designed mm -hmm. yes. by God. Yes. We are the way we are because we are designed by God. Listen, regardless mm -hmm. of what the TV, Brothers. what the movies, yes. what the magazines, All right. what your classmates yes, may say, Come on. how you should look, yeah. how you should act, Come on, they must first realize that they need Christ's esteem in their life. Uh -huh. Young girls mm -hmm. practicing all types of bad behavior in regards up. to getting rid of food mm -hmm. in order to look skinny and to look thin. Mm -hmm. Messing up their bodies with a lot of different things, right. trying to look like what the movies oh. say they ought to look like. Come on, Folk telling them they're not pretty enough the way they are. Yeah, yeah. You need to look in the mirror and say, God, I thank you yeah. for making me just the way I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I may not look like a Coca-Cola bottle. Yeah. I may be pleasantly plump, but God right. says it's all right. God says he made me fearfully and wonderfully. And there's nothing that can happen to me that God himself didn't make right. God is an awesome God. God is a sustaining God. And God did not make any junk. So when you're looking, you got a little extra over here and a little extra over there. Just say, Lord God, you did a real good job. God just gave you a little extra over there and a little extra over there. And when your hair is not long like everybody else, don't worry about it. Because God gave you just what he wanted you. Why? Because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. But billions of dollars a year are being spent to the contrary to teach you and inform your thinking and your mind that you don't measure up. Measure up to who? Come on. Come on. Come on. The Holy Spirit held that one back. I'm so glad he did. It's important for us to understand that God loves you for who you are. That you are designed in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. Amen. And I can declare to you on the authority of Scripture that God does not make any junk. You are not a mistake. You may have been born blind, but you're not a mistake. You may have to live in a wheelchair for the remainder of your life, but you're not a mistake. You may walk with a limp, but you're not a mistake. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God designed you for the purpose that he has in your life. And some little thing like a little switch walking around could not do what he need done over here. I didn't say anything about self-esteem. I said Christ. Esteem. I, I find esteem in who I am, not from what the world says. I find validation for who I am, not from what the world declares. I find that from what God's word tells me. Design, but then there's second D is destiny. Destiny, destiny, destiny. We will discover our purpose when we start a relationship with our Heavenly Father. You see, he's the one that determines our destiny. Yeah. Proverbs 3, you've read it many times. Proverbs 3 and 3 starts out this way. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them on the tables of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God. Listen to that. In the sight of God. In other words, if I find high esteem in the sight of God, and it says, and man. In other words, here I got this thing backwards. I'm trying to find esteem in man and hoping God approves. God says find esteem in God first. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And then the way you carry yourself. Yeah, yeah. My hair is not that long. I'm kind of a portly kind of a guy figure, but that's all right. It's the way that I carry myself. They look at me and say, there's no shame in his game. There's no shame in her game. Why? Because you found your esteem in God, and man has no choice but to say, well, go on with your bad self. Amen. Amen. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Listen, in all your ways, in all your ways, in every last one of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Finding purpose for your destiny is putting your trust in the Lord. Parents, we are to lead our families to Christ. And the third thing, let me hurry on. The third thing is duty. Duty. Design, destiny, and duty. Now, I'm talking about service. We find our purpose through service to others. As we discover what we have to offer. Our purpose is not just about us getting a prestigious job, making a whole lot of money, becoming famous and popular, but it's about using what God has given to us to help somebody else. You really want to find purpose in life? What do you have to offer somebody else? Right there, you begin to find your purpose in life. Let me wrap this point up with 1 Corinthians 12, 8. It says, in, in the New Living Translation, it says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Isn't that good news? Great news. Part of the purpose of my life is to come alongside of you the best that I can to try to help you. That's right. That's right. Now, we, 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 we clap a little bit on that one. But conversely, part of the purpose of your life is to come alongside me and help me. You got fewer claps on that one. That, that, that's all right. Let, just let that sink in. We really are supposed to be about other people. It's not about us. It's about training our young people to care and love about other people. So I love when our youth and our children go on these little excursions around town, giving blankets to the less fortunate than ourselves, going into the convalescent home, sharing songs of Zion with them. They're learning to what? Be about other people. That's what it's all about. It's that love that we have, that Christ has, that God's Holy Spirit is working through us as an instrument, as a vessel to about other people. Because to whom much has been given, much The fifth thing is successful parenting is understanding that there's a need to be heard Mm -hmm. and to be listened to. Now this goes both ways. Young people today are growing up in an information age. Mm -hmm. Information is coming to them constantly and so quickly all the time. Not all of them are comfortable with it in spite of what they tell you. Some of them do not have the social or the emotional maturity to handle all this new technology at the same rate as everybody else. As parents, we have to be tuned to that. We can want our children to be fashionable. Here's the latest iPhone. Here's the latest iPad. The internet and the social media network has changed everything in our lives today. Just a side note, let me just throw this in there parenthetically. This HBO and Showtime after 9 p.m. in the evenings, a lot of those stations don't have any useful information or appropriate entertainment. Let me just say it straight up. It's straight up porn. And many of our young people are losing their innocence through voyeurism and pornography. However, in the middle of all this flood of some good and some evil information, Many young people feel that their voices are being drowned out and they want somebody to hear them above all the other voices. Most of them would actually welcome a serious conversation with a caring adult. They have opinions and they want someone to share them with. But it takes time and too many times parents are not willing to give them what they need. But the Bible says train up. That means to apprentice. That means to come alongside. And not just tell them what they're supposed to be doing. Yes, you're supposed to teach them. But training is teaching and showing it and demonstrating. And, and when we sit down at night, we ought to.
talk about it. And at the dinner table, we ought to have some conversation about life. And we, we, we were not only telling them about our experiences, but sometimes we got to listen to their experiences and not be so quick to always want to fix their experiences and tell them, all you need to do is this, but just hear what they're saying. Hear where their heart is. Hear where their level of maturity may be or may not be. And they begin to pray for them. And God will reveal to them as well as to you how to what, make that relationship more of what it needs to be. Part of training is good communication. Now, please don't go home today and, uh, and seek validation from your child. I heard what pastor say today. Uh, uh, you, are you and I okay? We okay? We're, 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 now, now, we're good, all right. Huh? Hey, I, you know I love you, baby. No, 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 don't you? Come, come on. Come give Papa a big hug. Kid. Come on. All right. That's you seeking validation for you. Yeah. Proverbs 1 and 8. My son, hear the instructions of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother for they will be graceful ornaments on your head and chains about your neck. Successful parenting, number six, understanding there is a need to be valued. A need to be valued. They simply want to know that they matter to someone. In a recent Gallup survey of young people today, one third of them said that they feel unappreciated and worthless. One third. All the children that are up here today, you count them. One, two, three, feels unworthy. One, two, three, feels unappreciated. One, two, three, feel unworthy. One, right on down the line. In our homes. And the sad thing, when you look at all these statistics, there's not much difference between those that are growing up in Christian homes and those of the world today. We'll talk about that later in the series. As a result, they are unable to find their real identity. They ask the question, who am I? And does my life, my life really matter to anyone? Many of you, our young people are thrown into that time of no longer being a child, but not quite an adult. As a result, they struggle to find their own identity. They need someone to tell them that they matter as young people. You get to be a child and have your cheeks pinched for the first 12 years of your life. And then six years of being a teenager, no longer a child, but yet not an adult. And then the remainder of your life after being a teenager, you're an adult. Psalms 8 and 3 says, when I look at the night sky and see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you have set them in place. What are morals, mortals, that you should think of us? Or what is man that you should think of us? Mere humans that you should care for us. For you made us a little lower than the angels. And you crowned us with glory and honor. Don't leave here this morning wondering if you're valued. God that created you created you a little lower than the angels. And he crowned us with glory and with honor. Lord, Lord. Come on, God. Come on. How, how, how can you walk around like you're sucking on lemons? How can you walk around like life is so bitter? How can you walk around without hope and joy and peace in your heart? He has crowned us with glory and honor. Yes, you matter to God. Help the preacher out. Look, look, look to your neighbor on both sides. You say, yes, yes. you matter to God. Matter to God. Look to your other neighbor and say, yes, yes. You, matter to God. you matter to God. Amen. Amen. And then finally, seventhly, successful parenting is understanding that there's a need for support. This means anything from helping with homework to showing up at various sporting events or recitals. It is one thing to get your young people involved in a lot of activities. It's quite another thing to be there for them. One thing young people are quick to admit is that they need support and lots of it. They want to be connected again. If we don't give them the support they need, they'll look somewhere else forward. For some of us, that means starting by forgiving them first. It's amazing how many people live in homes where there's resentment. Resentment against the parents or parents having resentment against the child. 
And we just live like that day in and day out. And we've proven that we can continue to live like that for years. And God is saying the first thing that we need to do is to forgive one another. Romans 12 and 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honoring and giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, but fervently in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And look at Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. In closing, the bottom line is this. Far more important than what we do with our lives is who we become in our living. Who we become. God is interested in your career we choose. Absolutely. Is God interested in the job I pick? The path I take? Absolutely. No matter what our careers may become, the far more important question is, who will I become? Will I let Christ rule my life? Will I be a person rooted and established in the love of Christ? Will I be a person God intended me to be? Will I be that person? Train up the child in the way he should go. And when he get old, he will not depart from it. Last illustration. It's entitled, If a Child Lives. I remember reading this once. If a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If he lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If he lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendships, he learns to find love in the world. If we all love more, this world would be a better place. The Bible said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Amen. And it's possible you're here this morning. And the Spirit of God was calling you to get some things right in your own life. No matter where you preach throughout the word of God, whether it's on parenting, when the word of God is spoken, it convicts hearts, it convicts lives. And it makes you want to draw closer to him. It draws you in. It reveals certain things about yourself that may not be right. And you know you want to be right with God. And what God is saying to you as well as to me today is that if we want to be right with God, the first thing we must do is seek God's forgiveness of everything that's wrong that's in our life. And God says that whosoever shall call upon me shall be saved. That means he's willing to forgive you of your sin. He's willing to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He's willing to seal you with his Holy Spirit. He's willing to give you a brand new start, a brand new beginning. We've all done enough wrong. We've all done enough bad stuff in our life to go straight to hell. But it's by God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy that he extends his arm out to you and to me today. He says that if you will come to me and accept me, I will come into your heart. I will come into your life. I will forget and wash away all those bad things. I'll give you a brand new start, a brand new beginning. Is that true, Pastor? A brand new start yes. and a brand new beginning. But yes. you don't know what I've done. A brand new start, brand new start. and a brand new beginning. Yes. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he had put his, his sins away from you. He yes. says, and they'll rise up against you no more. He says, I, I won't even remember them anymore. That's a brand new start yes. and a brand yes. new beginning. Regardless to how old you may be in the house today or to the youngest one in the house, that same invitation goes out to you. Do you want Christ in your heart? Do you want a start? Do you want a fresh start, a fresh beginning? If so, pray this simple prayer along with me. 
I'm going to ask the church to bow with me just for a moment and just say this simple prayer along with me that you want Christ to come into your heart. You want Christ to come into your life. Just say these words. You can say them out loud. You can say them in the private chambers of your own heart. Either way, the Lord will hear your prayer. Just say these words. Just say, Lord Jesus, I ask now that you come into my life and save me from my sin. I believe that you died on the cross, that you were buried, and that on the third day morning, you rose from the grave with all power in heaven and in earth in your hands. I thank you today for coming into my life and saving me from my sin and the penalty of my sin. I give you praise. With your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer today, very quickly, just raise your hand right where you are. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. Father God, we thank you for these you brought out of darkness. Yes. Thank you. Brought them into your glorious and marvelous light. Thank you, Father, for touching their souls. Thank you. For hearing the word of God. Yes. And receiving the word of God. Yes. And responding to the word of God. Thank you. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. For all of these that you have brought into eternal salvation this day. Putting a smile upon their heart. And I pray that you put praise on their lips. Fill their spirit with the joy that only you can. Touch them, Father. For it's in Jesus' strong and mighty name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.